Ruby, why don't you go outside? Can you, can you close the gates to, there too? All right. Hey, I had right, a bunch now of we're work. live. <laughs> oh, I had a bunch of work stuff to do this morning, and and my wife was freaking out, like, "Oh my god, they're gonna see our bedroom, make the bed." But I, I, like everyone I zoomed in with, everyone was just like, "Dirty clothes everywhere." Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it's the new world order, right? I yeah. mean, it's like everybody thought the new world order was gonna be about like finance or something like that. It's actually just everybody working out of their bedroom. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's for me, it's not bad at all. I mean, it's no. sort of. I, your, uh, your trip to the office is a trip to the uh, kitchen to make coffee in the morning, and then uh, yeah. and then back to your uh, back to your laptop, right? This is yeah. I mean, I'm actually very happy with it because I'm. We had an extra week of spring break, but now we're we're <laughs> teaching again. Mm -hmm. oh. But it's still like more spring break because. I Are there still I, people down there on the beach? I mean, come on, what's going on? No, no. I mean, there was like a week and a half ago, but I, I think they essentially they put on a cure few and they they shut everything down at this point. So I'm so where I, you, I live where right are you on coming the, in from. What's that? Where are you calling from, or where are you in Miami? Yeah, I'm right in the center of Miami. I'm right in the okay. middle of downtown. So I look out my window right up the pipe of Miami, which is Biscayne, and there's maybe one car on it at any given time. Wow. Now. That's surreal. All right. All right. I well, here's, uh, here's what we do. We typically um, we'll talk about – we'll do a little bit of a teaser, what we're going to talk about. Then we'll talk about our beverages that we have for just a few minutes, and then we'll get into the actual topic. So – um, and everything obviously has an angle towards persuasion, which your topic is already there. So shouldn't be any, should I'm be not any. feeling that well. So I decided not to drink. Is that going to okay. be all right? No, no, that's fine. No, should that's I lie fine. and say there's tequila in my tea? Or <laughs> you something can say like whatever that? you want, no. <laughs> whatever makes you feel good. Now we, we have plenty of guests that just drink water or nothing at all. Okay. Like, I don't want to come off like a, I don't want to come off like a prude, but I said to my, we had hot dogs and extra sauerkraut for lunch and I'm not feeling ah, good. So I'm like, uh, I'll save the wine for later. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It might've been good fermentation. Go ahead and finish that sauerkraut off with the fermentation. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get started here. All right. Um, oh, do you want to just call you Joe or how do you want? Yeah. Joe, Joe is perfectly fine. Cool. Okay. Cool. And we'll give you an introduction. Um, we'll uh, key up, we'll do our general introduction then introduce you. And uh, then we'll get right into our beverages. Right, here we go. Three, two, one. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with Sean McCool. And we have another guest with us today from Miami, Florida. Joe, how do you, um, you have an interesting last name. So how do you, can you help us out with the pronunciation? Uh, it's Yuzinski. Yuzinski. All right. Okay. Somehow I left off the I on, uh, is there an I on the end of? Is yeah, it it's SK? very, it's, it's very Polish. Okay. Okay. So I well, guess when, when grandpa came over on the boat, they cut like 30 letters out of the name. Mm -hmm. um, but my view is they should have kept cutting like probably eight more. <laughs> so I don't know why they stopped here. It's sort of arbitrary, but yeah, that, that is a strange collection of letters there. It's, it's almost like a bad wheel of fortune puzzle. I don't know. But like, it, it's so... weird. You would think nobody would have this name, um, but I keep running into other PhDs uh -huh. who yeah. are J J Uzinski. So there's a physicist named Jessica Uzinski and, yeah, uh, wow. Historian and all and all this stuff. Um, That's bizarre. Yeah, I got really nervous because there was a Barry Joseph Uzinski, and uh -oh. he was killed in some freak plane accident. And I uh -oh. got nervous because I thought maybe the Terminator was coming after <laughs> all right. the Joe Uzinskis in the phone book, and I was going to be next. So, but that hasn't so, happened yet. So, sounds kind of right. like a conspiracy, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I love the '80s movie reference, so we we appreciate. We're always up for good '80s movies references. So oh, good, good. good stuff, yeah. good stuff. Well, so uh, Joe, let me introduce Joe. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Miami. Uh, he studies public opinion and mass media with a focus on conspiracy theories, which uh, is exactly our topic today and how people are. Uh, persuaded and influenced by conspiracies. Um, his focus is on conspiracy theories, misinformation, disinformation. He is the co-author of 
American Conspiracy Theories, an editor of Conspiracy Theories and People Who Believe Them. Um, so, uh, Joe, thanks for coming on. This should, this will be a really interesting topic given the times that we're in right now because uh, you see a lot of conspiracies being churned out with the uh, with this pandemic going on. Yeah, so we actually got some some polls into the uh, um, out into the countryside um, last week, and we got some fresh data in. Ooh. But these beliefs about coronavirus uh, that are conspiratorial in nature are not fringe mm -hmm. ideas in any in any way. So, right. uh, just two two examples that we asked about: we asked people if uh, COVID nineteen was being exaggerated in order to hurt President Trump. Mm -hmm. And we had 29% say yes. Mm -hmm. And then we asked if it was created and purposely spread as, as I think as a bioweapon. And I think we had 31% say yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we'll get in after we uh, talk a little bit about our beverages, we'll get into how those numbers compare with other theories to give people a better idea of, of is that normal? Is that not normal? I also think it's fascinating, Jonathan, that, we're talking about conspiracy theories on this episode, and Joe is an expert. I mean, that's amazing. That, that coincidence happened. <laughs> what like what that. a coincidence! It's almost as if it was planned. I know it's like a conspiracy <laughs> of sorts. So, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share my beverage. Uh, All right, but it's gonna be super quick because you know on quarantine here on lockdown, I haven't been out of the house in like a week. Um, mm -hmm. Not because I can't, but because I just haven't because this has been my life for 10 years as a copywriter and freelancer um but so i'm just going to the old fridge i've still got one oh, more man. chocolate stout you know left um you're wearing getting, that out man i know my my beer game is getting weak with this <laughs> this conspiracy I, I just don't want to fight the toilet paper nazis and and poachers and stuff <clears throat> like that like this is texas open carry is legal here you know so like mm -hmm. oh yeah you grab the wrong set of toilet paper. I don't know. It could be it. So I, I just don't <laughs> want to be around that kind of action, but I know you have a beer that you're very excited about. Mm, yeah. It's a new one. It's a new one. Um, Ennis and Goon who we've had on before, but this is their barrel aged, uh, Irish whiskey stout. So, um, I, I'm like you, I don't want to adventure out to any grocery stores, uh, given the mass hysteria that's going on. So that's the yeah. last place I want to be, but thankfully I have a liquor store that's not too far from my place and, uh, liquor stores in my state have been, they're still deemed as essential business. Essential, yes. Are here too. <laughs> so I can go down there, walk in the cooler and, uh, they've got a new one on tap. So I am, uh, I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta jump on this. Cause I was so it's kind of a safe crazy. space. Yep. All it's this, safe, right? Yeah, exactly. So I just stand in the cooler for like 15, <laughs> 15 minutes or so. And, and uh kill any sleep. bacteria that's or right, whatever that's right except for i think it's heat resistant not cold resistant so. <laughs> whoops <laughs> you can come here second. you can you can come here to austin or i'm sure in miami like it's been 90 here the last three days so there's uh there's no no virus is, is going to be surviving here in austin i think they said 70 <laughs> yeah. 72 was where it or 78 something like that is where yeah. it was i heard so. scott adams say on a podcast today that maybe Global warming will be what saves us. <laughs> It'll be the, the friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's a Republican conspiracy right there. <laughs> so anyway, we knew this quick, was coming. <laughs> 7.4% ABV. All right. Uh, nice, thick English stout here. Um, so I'm excited to, uh, to try this one. I know what yours tastes like, Sean. And Joe, what are you drinking? You're having water? Well, I drank too much so wine good. last night, so now uh, I wasn't feeling well, so my wife made me a ginger tea. Oh, that's nice. That's very <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're good. You can make it up tonight. It's Friday. Well, we, we, well Total Wines <laughs> is also a essential business, so we made oh, yeah. a run there a couple of days ago, and um, we, we pulled in like 40 bottles. Wow. So that's, that's some serious, uh, Oh yeah. So down. You, well, we you didn't know how long we were going to be stuck yeah. here. So. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what are your, what's your, uh, what's your, uh, wine of choice? What do you, what do you tend to gravitate to? So we were big fans of, uh, uh, California reds mm -hmm. and particularly big cabs. And, yep. and we've been stuck on that for a long time, but we started traveling around a little bit mm -hmm. and 
partially because we've been told we can't go anywhere now. We sort of want to tour the world. So we've gotten <laughs> wine from like eight different countries. So every night we're sort of exploring that particular. Oh, place. cool. Yeah, that's, it. that's, that's nice. one way to do it. So Little tonight we're having a, uh, a German red. Ah, a German red in the living room. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've seen some of those little wine tour memes. Uh, people taking wine tours of their house, yep. different, you know, the dining room tour, the mm -hmm. living room tour. So people are going crazy, and it's only been a week. <laughs> uh, but hey, so let's uh, let's let's talk conspiracy theories. Yeah, it's always fun. And um, tell it before we start. Tell us a little background on yourself, yeah. Joe. Give us a little history of yourself. Your uh, you're an associate professor at University of Miami. Can you give us a little background of your, uh, of your, of your, uh, give us some background on Joe. So, uh, born in Connecticut, weirdly on 9-11, um, moved oh, wow. to New Hampshire with my family, uh, as part of the defense boom in the early eighties. And, um, so it should be no shock that I'm a libertarian, sort mm -hmm. of a, you know, white male college educated dude from New Hampshire. <laughs> Okay. Uh, a fairly libertarian. Uh, got my bachelor's at Plymouth State, which is way up in the woods of New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and did the fraternity thing. So that took me seven years to graduate. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> people were making the joke to me like, oh, seven years, you should be a doctor. So I'm like, screw you, I'll go get a doctorate. So uh, I got my master's at uh, UNH a little while after that. And then um, I got into statistics, so they said you should go get a PhD. So I did that at University of Arizona. And then as I was finishing there, I got the job here in, in Miami in 2007. And I've been here uh, ever since. My my first uh, research interest was, was media and why they reported the things that they did and what effect that had on people. Mm -hmm. And then around 10 years ago, somebody came to me with the the amorphous idea like, hey, conspiracy theories, causes and consequences. And I was like, no one cares about that. That's fringe and weird and stupid. And <laughs> um, <laughs> but I did it anyway. And for the first couple of years we were working on it, people were like, no, nobody believes this stuff. This is this is right. not relevant in any in any way. And uh, boy, I can't imagine anyone saying that now. Yeah. So, yeah. I, oh, wow. I, I worked, uh, Joe, I worked in the financial newsletter industry for a while as a copywriter and that that market tends to be the you know 60 plus year old grumpy white man yep. which is a lot of the conspiracy theorists i think too uh big part of the crowd anyway yeah and it was amazing just the the number like promotions that you could kind of start tying towards or leaning kind of conspiracy always did really well so yeah, yeah there's there's definitely a lot of people that that buy into it but I'm sure you can tell us more about that than, than we could imagine. So let's do that. Well, it's, uh, I mean, to your point, it sells, I mean, yeah, it, and, does sell. and, and it sells in fringe outlets, but it sells in, in mainstream places too. And even mainstream sources of news use it, or at least tease, tease these ideas to pull in clicks. So like why does it sell? Uh, because people, there's a number of people out there who have this mentality that you know the, the world is run by conspiracies events and circumstances are best explained by shadowy powerful groups working in secret against us mm -hmm. and because they don't get that normally when you sort of tease or hint at it more directly it sort of pulls those audiences right in to it so i'll give you a good example of this the washington post ran a couple of articles maybe two months ago about uh ufos now, UFO doesn't mean alien. Right. right. It means somebody saw something they don't know what it is. Well, so what? Right. Right. But anyway, they were te they were putting these headlines out there to make it sound like, you know, Navy pilots identify, you know, aliens are flying around everywhere. <laughs> uh, when in fact, it said no such thing. And it was right. very flimsy reporting that they were doing in the first place. But I'll tell you, these things get get a, get a lot of clicks. I mean, the number one show. Uh, or the number one shows that ever ran, I think, on Animal Planet were, was the one about the Navy conspiracy to kill the mermaids. It was wow. Mermaid, the Body Found. That was completely made up, but it was the number one show. And then uh, Finding Bigfoot. And yeah. while Bigfoot's not a conspiracy, I mean, you know, they still haven't found him to let the cat out of the bag. Yeah. 
Um, well, but one of my favorite shows in college was X Files. I mean, that was like yeah, that was at the top of the list. I had to watch X Files all the time. Yeah, mine. So. Yeah, mine too. Um, but now it's sort of gone from, hey, here's this fiction show that yeah. that does these things too. The history, <laughs> the history Channel is now half conspiracy nonsense. I mean, it's all right. ancient aliens and yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, stuff like that. So who are the mo- who are people that? I guess my question to start with is, what demographics or what people are most inclined to buy into uh, conspiracies? Is there a general de- is there a, a general audience, or is it you know pretty wide range of people that buy into different different conspiracies, or are there a certain sub- segment of people that buy into certain things that generally the conspiracies that I see are. Uh, a massive conspiracy, like you said, of of certain powers that are in control of things, and they have a certain agenda that they're planning. So, what what's the audience that usually feeds into this? So, each conspiracy will sort of have its own audience. Mm-hmm. So, some are aimed at people on the left. You know, some are more aimed at people on the right. I mean, if I'm trying to push the idea that Barack Obama faked his birth certificate, I'm not going to be shopping that to Democrats and liberals. <laughs> I'm going to be shopping right. that to Republicans and conservatives. Um, so it's it's different for each one. But what we find is that the general underlying mentality that leads people towards that, that line of thinking um, is even across political party, across mm-hmm. political ideology, across race, across gender, and, and across age. Um, so you, you, I often ask people, like, close your eyes, imagine who that conspiracy theorist is. And they say, oh, it's, you know, some uh, 50-year-old white dude living in his mom's basement um, who's, you know, got some radical conservative viewpoint um, in a ham radio. Right. Um, but it's not, it's not that at all. I mean, just, just to, the best example I use to demonstrate that is if you look through all the different hosts that have been on The View, Mm-hmm. Almost all of them have espoused cons- one conspiracy theory or another, like Jenny McCarthy and the vaccine thing. Right. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg talked about the faked moon landing. Um, so so, so um, there have been quite a few. And you could find examples of people of all <clears throat> different backgrounds buying in. My grandfather yeah. didn't believe in the moon landing. I used to think like, it was funny because I would always... Uh, I, I remember as a kid, he would he thought this was it was just a big uh, conspiracy by the government, and they they um, they filmed this in a Hollywood setting or some kind of Hollywood studio out in out in California or wherever, and uh, put it all together. So he was he was one of those guys on the fringe. <laughs> so that one really is fringe. So when we poll on that, cause when I ask people think of a conspiracy theory, you right. often get birther, truther, moon yeah. landings, Kennedy. Yeah. Um, but the moon landing thing gets about 5% in this mm-hmm. country when we poll on it. And part of it is because it's a point of national pride for Americans that, you know, we did it. Obviously we didn't fake it. When you ask France, it's almost 20% that say it was fake. Ah, interesting. They're like, yeah, screw the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> they well, you know, there's that, there's that, uh, is. <laughs> is it on Amazon or Netflix? There's a, there's a new series that is, they flip the narrative, like Russia won and got to the moon first. Wow. And it's a whole, like yeah. the chain of events that happened after yeah. that. Wow. Which is great, great premise for a story. Um, but that really doesn't play into the conspiracy theory. But I think, so I'm curious on your thoughts on this. Joe, the I've noticed conspiracy theories, they have just enough proof or what seems like proof to make them kind of believable. Like, you know, they tend to have good uh, quotes or they'll pull good, you know, a good picture from somewhere or Photoshop it, whatever's required. But it seems like there's always just enough to create doubt. Like, is that how they work? I mean, how does a conspiracy theory take hold? How does it because even 5%, I mean, that's a lot of people, numerically speaking, 5% of 300 million people or however you do your polling, that, that, if, that if that worked out math-wise, that's a lot of people. So how do, how do that many people believe? Like what's required to give weight to a conspiracy theory? 
So it's not so much the evidence. I mean, people tend to think about, oh, what are the evidence that, that the conspiracy theorists bring with them? Or what are the facts? Or what are the particular questions that they pose? It's usually, I mean, I think of a model this way, that people have a set of predispositions that will lead them to it. Mm-hmm. And then they'll latch on to evidence afterwards to rationalize it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean, it, you know, you would like to think that in a democracy, people gather evidence, then come to conclusions, and then act on those conclusions. But it really doesn't work like that at all. Right. It's the conclusions first, and then you pick and choose the evidence you want after the fact. Um, and and that's, that's how it really works with the, uh, uh, with the conspiracy theories, because, I mean, there are a lot of people who will just buy in, and then you ask them why, and, and they're not pulling out you know, pieces of evidence. Like if you ask a lot of 9-11 truthers why they believe that uh, the Twin Towers were brought down by a conspiracy, they're mm-hmm. not going to pull out like, oh, I have this chemical report that shows that it was this particular explosive was found there or something like that. They'll just be like, it just feels right to me. Hmm. Interesting. What about this new, uh, so here's one that's going around on social media now and i'm sure you're you're pretty aware of this this q what is it q anon mm-hmm. conspiracy theory yeah q anon so, yeah q anon uh that revolves around this anonymous account known as q mm-hmm. and uh i guess it's it's basically i guess it, it's it involves taking down deep state uh members and then pedophile rings <laughs> so I've seen this big time and, and people that I'm actually friends with on social media that are posting these really cryptic tweets and uh, posts that like only people, I guess, in their circles understand because every time they post them, I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, it seems really, really wacky. Like I can go through it a little bit. I mean, it seems yeah. really, really wacky, but it's actually, you know, not that crazy in, in its basic parts. Yeah. I'm not saying it's true. Right. It's just that these ideas have been around essentially forever. For a long I mean, if, time, you go, yeah. if you go to Oliver Stone's JFK, right. if you watch that movie, it's a deep state, you know, uh, a bunch of deep state pedophiles who are working to kill the president. And mm-hmm. that's essentially what QAnon is. It's somebody mm-hmm. pretending to be a intelligence operative who's giving clues on, was giving clues on 8chan. Now it's somewhere else. Um, right. about Donald Trump's fight against the satanic pedophile sex trafficking deep state ring, uh, which includes the Bushes, the Clintons, the Obamas, and, and Tom Hanks. Yeah. Um, and the Queen. <laughs> and um, they're, all, <laughs> they're all eating babies for the magical powers, which keep mm-hmm. these satanic uh, pedophiles alive longer than the rest of us. And soon when the great awakening happens, we will all find out the truth of this and uh, evil will be banished. And uh, um, I don't know, some of their predictions are, you know, we're going to have magical natural cures for everything and we'll all be rich and there'll be no student loan debt and we'll even learn how to fly. <laughs> wow. So what, what happens so. when Pete, when things don't play out? Because one of the things, you know, Sean and I talk about, because we talk about persuasion and influence and we reference a lot of times um, Robert Cialdini's famous book, The uh, Psychology of Influence or The Psychology of Persuasion, Influence mm-hmm. the Psychology of Persuasion, where he talks about commitment and consistency. So people that buy into something, they try to stay, they, they, once, once you buy into something from a psychological standpoint, you want to support that no matter what. So you're kind of going to, you're going to stand ground as long as you can no matter what changes or what happens. And so I notice what I notice is, is some of these things as some of the, the events don't play out according to the way a lot of these conspiracists uh, say they will. It seems to me from my standpoint, when I look at it, it seems to me like they kind of shift the game. They kind of shift the way. Um, okay. Well, it's different now you know, what we've learned is something completely different. And maybe it's not, maybe it's not Donald Trump taking down uh, these, uh, these people, you know, these pedophiles and, 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 and these groups, maybe it's completely shifted and maybe it's an attack on him in and of itself, or maybe, you know, things play out. So I don't know. It just, it seems to me that people that buy into things like this, sometimes they shift their perspective and it's like, no, that's, you know, it, it, there's never any 
solid ground on that. And, but they'll keep the, you know, they'll stand firm no matter what they'll, they'll stay true to the cause, even if they do shift their principles and what they believe. Yeah. You can always come up with post hoc reasons. So there was a good study <laughs> in the fifties and sixties of uh, apocalypse cults. Yeah. So when they, you know, the cult was convinced the, you know, the, the world was going to end on Tuesday and then Wednesday happens and they have to come up with a reason <laughs> and right. nobody quits the cult. Right. They believe even, even, even more ardently at that point. Cause they're like, God <laughs> stepped in at the last minute because of our prayers. Now we have to make sure that we triple our efforts and that happens over and over again. But I mean, with, with conspiracy theories more specifically, I mean, think about the birther thing. I mean, you had, yeah. um, First, the birther argument was he doesn't have a birth certificate. So we, so Obama presented his birth certificate. And then they said, well, it doesn't count because it's this isn't the long-form birth certificate. So then he gave up the long-form birth certificate. And they said, well, that's forged. <laughs> so it's like there was nothing that you were going to do that right. was going to um, change their mind. So it, 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 none of the beliefs were, were grounded on evidence. There were, it was theology at that point. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that's the same thing with QAnon is that they, you know, Q is, is wrong about so many things. Like for, he said, Trump won't be impeached. He was impeached mm -hmm. like three days later. Right, right. Um, but what they say is like um, Q is engaged in, in giving us real information, but he's also engaged in putting out disinformation to trick the deep state. <laughs> So he could be right or wrong and right. you never know. So that's, to me, it's like, why would you believe anything he said? Because it's all nonsense. <laughs> yeah, but that's brilliant. I mean, that's that from a marketing standpoint, that's pretty brilliant. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question, Joe. So when does something go from being like just a theory and then it, when does it tip over into conspiracy theory? So like, I don't know, like flat earth, is that a conspiracy theory or is that just an outdated theory or is that a theory like, because there's a lot of flat earthers around. Like, would you classify that as a conspiracy theory or just bad science? Or <laughs> it, it, it would depend on know. what's on what's motivating it. So let, let me give you a different e example just to just to um, to show the distinction. So I could say I I don't believe I don't think vaccines are safe. Mm -hmm. um, I could be espousing a conspiracy theory, but then I'm again, I might not be for some reason. I just, I just might not think they're safe. Um, if I said, I believe that vaccines are dangerous and pharmaceutical companies and the government are hiding that information from us. Now I'm engaging in, in conspiracy theory. Okay. Um, so does it come so, down to motive? Yeah. So I could say, I think the earth is flat, which isn't necessarily conspiracy theory on itself. Mm -hmm. um, but if I said, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, astronomers and physics professors and airplane pilots and boat captains are all covering <laughs> up the truth of the Earth's shape uh, yeah. to deceive me, um, then I'd be engaging in conspiracy theory. So it sort of depends sure. where, where, it, where it comes from. Yeah. So and the and the the reason people would attach to that would be very different. You know, conspiracy theory would be one thing if they just believe it for whatever reason, you know, that's, you know, they're going to have their own, their other reasons. So, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause generally when you think about conspiracy theory, it's, it's not just something that that's dubious or wrong or weird or fringe. It's, it's very specific in the sense that, or at least in how I use the term, it's that you have a, a group of people working in secret for their own benefit against mm. the common good um, okay. and in a way that sort of subverts our bedrock ground rules against yeah. force and fraud. Right. Okay. So we talked right, you know, at the top of the show, we talked about you did two, you've done two recent polls and the numbers came back at 29, I think in 31%, something like that. Um, recap those questions and tell us kind of where that falls, like in the history of, you know, believability conspiracy. And then the second part of that question, is that due to recency bias? Is that you know, or something else, like, will those numbers typically fade over time or will they get stronger? Or um, well, we hope they're fade. So, so the first question was, do you think that uh, um, the, the effects of, of COVID-19 are, are being exaggerated to make President Trump look bad? And we got 29% okay. saying yes. And then the second one we asked about was, uh, was COVID-19 a 
you know, purposely created and then purposely released, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps as a bioweapon or something like that. And we got 31% there. So with the first question, what we found when we analyzed the data was that uh, Republicans were more were much more likely to believe in that one than than Democrats. Mm -hmm. And in particular, Republicans who really liked Trump and paid a lot of attention to politics. Okay. And so the reason for that, that we surmise is that Trump was, you know, putting out these signals early on, you know, and he called it the Democrats new hoax that they were trying to hurt his presidency in election year and that this was no worse than a common cold. So that's that's why we have a lot of Republicans believing that mm -hmm. it's because elites were, were pushing it for the second belief that it's sort of a, you know, purposely released bioweapon. Um, it is slightly more Republican than Democrat, but not by much. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is probably that you've had some more minor Republicans like Senator Tom Cotton pushing this idea that the Chinese created it in a laboratory and things yeah. like that. Um, in terms of the, the size of those numbers, I mean, they're not the most believed conspiracy theories right now, but they're more believed than most. Mm -hmm. So in, in the last 50 years, probably the most popular conspiracy theory is Kennedy. Okay. Um, yep. Generally speaking. So if you put er, if you take everybody who believes in some form of Kennedy conspiracy theory, and put them together, Right now, you get between 50 and 60% of the U.S. But, wow. but during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s, it was 80%. Really? Wow. So that's wow. probably the American con conspiracy theory. So at 30%, these don't really touch that. But these are more than um, birtherism was, which was capping around 25% at most. Um, trutherism for a long time was around 25%. And it's actually been going up. Um, but just because more Republicans feel comfortable buying into it because there's less of a partisan element there now with Bush being out of politics. Okay. So what are the, what are the number one, like what's the top conspiracy theory now you mentioned there's, these aren't as big as the current. I mean, it, besides Kennedy, is there are some others that are kind of polling that, that, that strongly? No. So then you go from Kennedy and then you have a big drop off. And okay. part, part of the reason is that most of the things that get polled on are political mm -hmm. conspiracy theories. And once you do that, you're automatically cutting your, your audience in half. Right. Yeah. So if you think about the way the Kennedy questions are asked on surveys, usually they say, was there a conspiracy to kill the president or a conspiracy to cover up um, the murder in some way? And you get right now about 60%. Anyone can buy into that no matter who they blame for it. Right. But if you but if I ask you, you know, do you think Barack Obama faked his birth certificate? Democrats are not going to say yes. Right. So essentially what you do with these partisan conspiracy theories is that you're not going to break out further than 25 percent, usually because it's only going to be one half of the country politically. And then within that half, just the people who are sort of um, inclined towards conspiracy theories in the first place. So do you see things like big pharma vaccine, like the vaccine stuff, is that split down political lines as well? Or does that tend to be? Yeah. So vaccines are, are you, depending on the poll and how you ask it usually comes out pretty even between both sides. And you, you have populations um, um, that have gotten infected with, with measles and whatnot because they don't take the vaccines, but for different reasons. So you'll, you know, you have people in California who want to be natural and whatnot. Um, so they skip vaccines and then they all catch it. But you also have, you know, uh, church groups in Texas um, that where the pastors tell them don't don't take the vaccines and then they don't. Um, and then they wind up catching it. Um, so but it's just it's different motivations for people uh, um, given their politics. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start a really strong conspiracy theory, it sounds to me like you don't want to do something political like it may be hot. <laughs> But if you really want to get widespread traction in a conspiracy theory, it, it needs to be kind of uh, agnostic politically and kind of something bigger than that. Is that, that true? Like so if, 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 you I, were looking, if you were looking for another job 
And yeah. you wanted to uh, turn this podcast thing into, you know, like Alex Jones light. Yeah, yeah. Let's here's the here's the advice I would give you: is go after the biggest enemies that everybody already hates. Right, mm -hmm. makes sense. So if you were to the globalist, uh, the global elites, right? Yeah. So don't go mm -hmm. after the Republicans or the Democrats. Right. Mm -hmm. Go after the political parties because nobody likes political parties, right? Right. right. Um, don't go after, you know, a specific congressperson, but go after Congress. Yeah. Uh, go after the big banks. Go after big, banks, uh, yeah. big mean corporations. Big corporations, yeah. And then and you, you, you could probably establish a following pretty, you know, pretty quickly. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, one of the guys that we follow a little bit here is, I don't know if you, you're familiar with him, Joe, probably, maybe, maybe not, but he's in the marketing space guy named Russell Brunson, he, he wrote this book called Expert Secrets. And one of the things he talks about there is, you know, kind of how cults are founded. And it's just what you're talking about. One of the things, one of the key principles, is you got to have a common enemy mm -hmm. and you got to find that big enemy, you know, to go after. Um, and that's for like, no matter what your business is, if you can find an enemy that your customers or your clients can buy into, even if you don't want to create a conspiracy theory, you just want to create more sales and things like that having that enemy just makes all the difference. And we, we did a, there's a book. Um, what was that? The Blair Warren book? Jonathan? Oh yeah. About the Jim Jones. Uh, it's just, uh, it's basically, I can't remember the name of the book or the, it's kind of a PDF, but Blair Warren talked about, I think it's called one sentence persuasion. Isn't that what it was called? Something like mm -hmm. that. Yep. But yeah, book you might, might or might not like Joe. Um, but he talks a lot about, things that people don't really want to admit in marketing and how similar they are to conspiracy theories or cults or all that kind of stuff. I mean, if you establish that common enemy, every, nothing else really matters. Hmm. Right. And you see this in politics historically and more recently. So like Bernie Sanders, he's, he's got a clear enemy, the 1%. Right. He doesn't have a clear theory about what they do or how they pull off their schemes. Cause out of the one side of his mouth, he says, Oh, they're a bunch of free market gamblers. Then out of the other side of his mouth, he says they're running a rigged system. Yeah. Can't be both. Yeah. And it's just like when Hitler That's said, you know, when Hitler said the Jews were subversive communists and they were rapacious money capitalists can't be both. <laughs> right. But, but he's playing but, to both. Yeah. Once sides. you identify the enemy that right. people don't like, you can go, you could then switch the message around to pull in the different audiences who might be concerned about different specific things. Well, we've, we've talked about this on previous episodes where, you know, Trump has been in his, when he became, when he was elected, you know, he made, he kind of made a lot of vague um, promises out there, but they were things where people from both sides that both sides could agree on. Right. So he didn't want to get into specifics, uh, but there were things that people probably who are blue collar, blue collar Democrats and Republicans could both come together on without getting into the details of things. And that helped him. That helped his cause back in 2016, I think, because a lot of people that were traditional Democrats switched over and voted for him uh, because of his even conser conservative Christians who, yeah. tip, you know, would not give Trump the time of day, but because he was going who he was running against. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been politics for the last sure quite a while now is it's more about who you're running against, like who you don't want elected in many cases than it is who you want elected. Like you're almost right. voting for the person that you don't want as much as yep. you are the person you want. Is that's why it's felt to me. Yeah, there is a negative aspect to partisanship too yeah. right mm -hmm. it's i have yeah. a group belonging but i hate your group yeah <laughs> and I've, it feels like more late lately it's been more like about i just you can't win so right. i'm gonna vote against you no matter yeah. who my guy is well trump's trump's path was was you know relied on that a lot mm -hmm. but he had he had, you had other tools at his disposal yeah mm -hmm. uh, you know and he went after white christians Mm -hmm. And he tapped into what we would call status threat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so he used the, the, the gendered rhetoric, the racial rhetoric, the xenophobic rhetoric mm -hmm. uh, to, to tap into something that a lot of people are, are feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and he was able to exploit that, particularly in the, in the Republican primary. 
because there's a yeah. funny thing with with you know republican leaders is they look out and they see the party that they want to see but that's not the party that actually exists right because right. the the real republican voters are not a bunch of milton friedman friedrich hayek right. small you know small market people i mean their mm -hmm. their views are probably on a lot of things are probably not all that different than democrats right and a lot of democrats views are not all that different on some things than republicans mm -hmm. and and most people are not ideological in the sense that you would you know, you would imagine if you watch Fox News and then MSNBC, yeah. people aren't like that in their views. Uh, instead, there's something more guttural going on that Trump mm -hmm. was able to tap into and really activate. Yeah. So how do we use like some of the elements of of good conspiracy theories you know, or well crafted conspiracy theories um, to persuade clients and customers and using our marketing and do it ethically uh if that's possible. i don't know if you could do it ethically all right so let's do it just, unethically i'll help you with that all right let's just <laughs> let's just easier. let's let the viewer let's let the listeners and viewers decide how they want to use it ethically <laughs> yes. or not let's be like, completely unethical and yeah then... let's let's just throw it out there and see see how people use it um and uh yeah so like what are the key elements we talked about a common enemy what else is there that you can you can use from really well kind of well done conspiracy theories. So when I, so what a lot of my colleagues do is they'll do experiments and surveys where they try to get people to give up their conspiracy theories. So they'll give them authoritative information to get them change their mind back to the real thing. I have done a lot of experiments where I get people to try to believe the, I try to get them to believe the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I try to con see what convinces them of the conspiracy theory, whether it's, you know, rhetoric or, or something like that. This is, this is what I find is that if you want to convince somebody of something, they should already be pre predisposed into buying into it. So you're not going to convince somebody of something they're dead against. It's, it's a non-starter. <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere. But if you can get somebody who has a set of predispositions and you can thread the needle along those, mm -hmm. um, then you will be able to pull them in. And you never have to be specific and you never have to give great evidence. You just have to align your message with how they already view the world. Yeah. So if they think the world is run by conspiracies, then throw out a conspiracy theory. If they have particular enemies that they are concerned about, then name those enemies. And once you do that, um, they will they will buy up what you uh, mm -hmm. what you're laying out there, and you don't have to add that much more. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting you say that. We've said dozens of times on this show. Uh, you know, one of the marketers that a lot of our listeners know is Dan Kennedy, and he has this saying that you know people really need two things or want two things. One, they want to be entertained, and then number two, they want to be um, convinced. They want to be encouraged that their current worldview is correct. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I hear you saying, kind of echoing that is that, yeah, if you can tap into what people already believe and then just maybe make a one to five degree, you know, offshoot of that, then it's a pretty easy road from there to kind of carry people along their, that reasoning. Yeah. I mean, think about why Alex Jones does so well. It's because his audience is already predisposed to buy into his ideas. Sure. Right. But but he can't convince anybody outside of that group, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's it's the same thing with any other conspiracy theory. There's a certain amount of people who can be convinced, mm -hmm. and you just tailor your message there. Yeah. So I think that's uh, why you know Bernie, you know Bernie, kind of, uh, you know, he did really well with a lot of the younger younger people because they were in on this uh you know a lot of the things that he said but i think when he got into i think his problem came when he got into kind of the older segment <laughs> the people that were a little older uh that were like wait a minute uh where's this all this money going to come from and um how are we going to give all this stuff away for free well i knew when i was in college and somebody said free, uh, free loans or, you know, not having to pay back loans or free money, free college, man, I would have been on that like, like crazy. But, um, 
I'm not a big fan of that now. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're the one. You're, uh, that's the thing when they say free college, it's like, well, what do you think? I'm going to work for free. I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. I'm work here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And they're like, well, the rich are going to pay. I'm like, that's your family. <laughs> that's right. you. Yeah, right. Exactly. You're, you're already paying. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's funny. So, Joe, um, we're running short here, but um, so what is kind of the the big lessons or pieces of wisdom that you've kind of picked up as you've learned, as you studied this, like about human nature, about persuasion, like what are some kind of your biggest ahas or maybe some things that surprised you? Cause it went, when you got into conspiracy, cause it sounds like you kind of stumbled into it a little bit. Uh, the two biggest misconceptions I had was that it was mostly people on the right and it was driven largely by the internet. Mm -hmm. And I think those two are completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So we find almost no difference between right and left. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the internet driving it, there's just no evidence that people are believing these ideas more now than sure. they did before the internet. Um, so it's, it, you know, every time I read a story about conspiracy theories, um, you know, journalists always blame the internet and social media, but it's that's just seeing the past with very rosy hindsight right yeah yeah because they've yeah. been around i mean conspiracy theories have been around for i ever. would think ever <laughs> and, yeah and, i mean like and you I mean, talk go, about jfk you know yeah. people on both sides i mean oliver stone for crying out loud did a did a movie I mean, on on that you know, go so. read the declaration of independence yeah. i mean the first three paragraphs are the best political prose ever written in the in the history of of mankind the mm -hmm. rest of it is a bunch of crazed conspiracy <laughs> stuff about the king, <laughs> most of which wasn't even true at all. So, um, it's well, that's you know, I, I'm a former copywriter, still do some copy, and you know, if you can get the headline and the mm -hmm. opening right, like it doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter what the rest of the letter says, yeah. like you, you get people there, they're sold, yep, they're hooked. Um, so, I'm just curious too, yeah, let's, let's, I want to go back to this JFK thing before we wrap up. So, the, the you know the, the I see most Americans probably believe uh, the conspiracy with JFK. I think the problem is there's too too way too many um, conspiracies out there of who who was responsible. Mm. So I think that you know it, I don't know. Do you see this? I mean, when you have multiple conspiracies, um, then people kind of gravitate towards the you know, the original story. That's what, I mean, just because, you know, you get, you get too many opinions in there. It's kind of like in marketing, we say when there's too many options out there, people actually just kind of do nothing and they kind of go with the flow. Uh, and, and, and I feel like that's a lot of times in conspiracies where whether it's true or not, like in the JFK, you have too many overarching uh, opinions on what might have happened and people are like well i don't know what to believe so i'm just going to kind of believe with what what we've been told <laughs> um yes and no so yeah. in, the, in the in i mean conspiracy theories are sort of like fan fiction it's like there's yeah. no official version like there's one official version of the official story right but with the conspiracy theories everyone is free to choose their to own adventure their own, yeah. and do whatever they want mm -hmm. um so in that sense i call them fan fiction um mm -hmm. and when we poll on these things it's like we can ask about one or two versions of a particular theory sure but we can't ask about every one and generally if you were, were to get a bunch of conspiracy theorists in the room even if they agreed on 9 11 being a conspiracy or jfk right. or something like that they're not going to agree on how or you know or who or any of the details um so it, it's I don't know if that dissuades people or if it pulls mm. more people in because they get just they just get to believe whatever it is they want. <laughs> right. Yeah. The you splinter know? splinter theories that come right. off of it. No, because if you that. came to me and said, I have this conspiracy theory for you, and I'd be like, Well, I agree with most of it, and I'll just fill in the holes, you know, right. with the stuff I like. And now right. I got my own, you know, sure. a la carte belief that I can mm. carry on and yeah, because yeah, um, once I buy in, like you said, I'm gonna start maybe I'll just start doing ways. some research and yeah. read an article and I'm like Okay, oh, this, I connect the dots a little differently than my, maybe you right. did. This supports what I what I originally thought. So uh, two final questions here for you, Joe. Number one, what is your favorite, your all-time favorite, most interesting conspiracy theory? Uh, when I first started doing the data collection on this, we ran into one. 
And it was that the CIA was creating a army of secret lesbians uh, to infiltrate the women's movement in the 1970s and then have uh, uh, erotic trysts uh, with the leaders of uh, women's groups and then and then blackmail them to take over the women's movement. Wow. wow. Never heard of that one. <laughs> was Subaru crazy. involved in this at all? <laughs> uh we just lost them as a sponsor <laughs> wherever had them but um so that's interesting so um and then so the second question would be what's the oldest conspiracy theory that's kind of still got legs jews <laughs> okay uh, yeah that makes sense yeah <laughs> Like how far back and like what, what specifically? Oh, you're going. Yeah. I mean, we could go back to, to, you know, to medieval on. Europe and then even right. a lot long before that. Yeah. Um, and just that they rule the world or they like, yeah, they rule the world. They're out for themselves. They're part of some scheme. Okay. Yeah. yeah there's a book written, actually written by a Jew. And I remember the statistic that he opened with, uh, his rabbi, Daniel Lappin. <clears throat> he, uh, he opened with the statistics that I think Jews are 3% of the world's population by race and they control 25% of the world's wealth. So that's a good starting place for a conspiracy theory. I would think is like, yeah. Cause conspiracy theories are about powerful people, right? Right. You don't hear a lot of theories about the, the guy with no arms and no legs who lives on the street corner. <laughs> no one's afraid of him conspiring against us. His name's Matt, right? And yeah. <laughs> Um, so, but, but when you have rich people, powerful people, uh, people who have control of things, then that's, that's where the theories are going to gravitate to, mm -hmm. uh, like a lightning rod. Do you think that's because that gives people an out for their life? If it's not going the way they want, if there's these big powerful forces that don't allow them to have what they want, uh, in some, or make it more, or make it more difficult scapegoating can make them very very powerful yeah, yeah. so it, 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 one one phrase that we use is that conspiracy theories are for losers a lot of times yep. so like who who complains after a you know after a basketball game or a football game not the winners it's the, right. the losers that we were cheated the refs the, got the refs yeah, or, they were they were they, they had them cook they were cooking the refs or the other yep. yeah the other team cheated or you know something like that after elections the winners don't complain. It's the losers who tend to complain. And they say, oh, you know, they, they rigged they rigged it or, or something like that. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to look in a mirror and say, I lost. These are the reasons why I lost. Yeah. I got beat by somebody else. It's much easier to say, well, I'm still better than them. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the game was rigged. Yeah, yeah the I old, mean the the no. New England Patriots, man. They, <laughs> they, I tell you, they they've got numerous conspiracy theories going about about those guys. Yeah, I mean, cheating, they, ball, cheating, yeah, you know, ball you know, inflation. Conspiracy theorizing about the Jets or like, <laughs> nobody or the Browns. <laughs> like, who cares? <laughs> yeah, it's like so, are the Browns still in the <laughs> league. You know, <laughs> no conspiracy theories there. <laughs> What's uh what's your all time favorite conspiracy movie? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> I, whenever the X Files first movie is on, I always watch that. Oh, and yeah. I used to I used yeah. to love Oliver Stone's JFK. Mm -hmm. um, but since I, I teach a conspiracy theory class and I, I show the the movie every semester, having watched it so many times, it's just really stupid, and there's so many holes in it. <laughs> It's just like everybody bet Kevin Costner is in on the conspiracy to kill the president. <laughs> it's yeah. like he's the only one who didn't do it. <laughs> That's funny. So your current favorite, then your favorite movie was was uh, was which one? The X Files movie. Yeah, X Files movie with JFK probably being the second, and then my yeah. third would be uh, it was made for TV on the Animal Planet, but it's Mermaid: The Body Found, and it's mm. actually pretty interesting if you watch it. <laughs> I might have to cue that up during the old quarantine. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it explains, um, it, well, it, it ties together human evolution, mm -hmm. um, mermaid sightings, and Navy uh, weapons testing into one grand conspiracy theory. Ah. Wow, that's, uh, somebody had a little too much punch that day when they were writing that, <laughs> that script. Well, they designed so. it to look like a real documentary. So they had mm -hmm. like fake doctors 
but being reenacted by other actors. So it looked like the fake doctors in the movie were actually real doctors. Yeah. And then NOAA, which is the, the you know, the, the government office that studies the ocean and whatnot. After this, this movie ran on Animal Planet, they were getting thousands and thousands of calls, people calling, release the mermaids, release the mermaids. Why are you testing weapons on the mermaids? So they had to put up a website saying, no, we're not killing mermaids. There's never been real mermaids anywhere. Oh my gosh. And then somebody played a joke. Um, well, they started a website based on the char- one of the characters in that movie. Mm-hmm. Dr. Paul Robertson, and then you could go Google Dr. Paul Robertson. And he had a website and it says this website's been taken down by the U.S. government. <laughs> Probably <laughs> so, has his own Twitter feed too. So people were looking at this like, "Oh my God, the government's trying to hide the truth about the the mermaid," and now they've well, gotten to the doctor. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean that's a great example of like people will just use whatever data comes out to to continue the belief and actually strengthen it. Right. That's yeah, crazy. but you you know go you know I don't have a lot of mermaid. <laughs> believers as friends but i know they're out there like go hang around in a crystal shop and you'll find them oh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're there <laughs> yeah hey it's just like bigfoot you may not see him but he's out there right yeah. so well man this has been really fun joe and uh i appreciate you taking some time on your yeah. your friday afternoon and um uh, we could probably talk about this all day but uh we're out of beer which means the show is <laughs> pretty much over um so jonathan unless you got anything else i'll let you take us home Joe, how can people find out more about some of the work and some of the stuff that you do? Uh, I am at uh, joeusinski.com, J-O-E-U-S-C-I-N-S-K-I. And okay. uh, um, they could find my my shorter writings and my and my books there. Well, we'll certainly post a link on our uh, page this week when we post this, and I'll send you a link once we have it out. Um, but, man, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. This has been a fun conversation. And... Uh, Love to have have you back on sometime. Well, thank you guys. All right. All right, that's it.